Okay, it's a real joy for me to get to be here. When uh, Brother Arnold called me, I thought, of course I'll come. I'd love to come. And uh, I'm going to give you my testimony, and it's not because I th think that you need to know about me, but I want you to know about what a great God we have. Amen. We serve a great God. Yeah. And uh, I was saved when I was uh, 11 years old in a church that uh, it's amazing anybody got saved there. And... Uh, <laughs> But once a year, we would have a revival. And at the end of that revival, people would get saved, and then we'd have a baptismal service, and then nobody got saved anymore until the next year. And uh, we had a good preacher that came in for the revival, and the Lord was speaking to my heart. And uh, I got real scared because I, I was too, I believe it or not, I was shy back then. I was too shy to go down the aisle. But yet I got real frightened because I thought, what if I die before next year? because I thought you could only get saved at revival meeting. Yeah. Uh, what, what if I die before next year? So finally, on the last night, I went forward, and uh, my Sunday school teacher led me to the Lord. And then uh, when I was 12 years old, my, my, I had a pastor's wife who was giving me all these books to read, and they were all missionary stories. So I was reading about Mary Celeste and Hudson Taylor and all these missionaries, and uh, the Lord spoke to me through those books. We had never had a missionary. We'd never seen a missionary. We didn't know what one looked like except those pictures in those books that I would see. And uh, well, the Lord spoke to me through those books. And I went forward in that church and told them God would call me to be a missionary, and nobody took me serious. And I know that because later they told me so. <laughs> but uh, the Lord put a desire in my heart like you wouldn't believe. I mean, I wanted to be a missionary. I thought, I just can't do it. Well, there were six of us kids, and my dad died when I was eight years old, and, and I was talking about going to college, and nobody out there in the country where I grew up had ever been to college, and here's the poorest kid in the whole community yeah. talking about college, and Mama forbade me to talk about it. Well, I didn't talk about it anymore, but I didn't forget it. Yeah. She said, I'll get you through high school, and you're on your own, and then she meant it. But uh, <laughs> I, uh, I got through high school one Thursday, and she moved me out of the house the next Thursday. But I moved over into Greenville and uh, got me a job in the old Greenville General Hospital, which is no more. And then uh, I uh, joined Tabernacle Baptist Church, if you know Dr. Harold Seidler. And he was my pastor for 35 years. And, and uh, by then I'm beginning to hear lots of missionaries and went off to Tennessee Temple and uh, heard all these missionaries. And so I, I, wanted, I wanted to be a missionary. And when I was in high school, I would cry myself to sleep. God, please, please, if you just let me be a missionary, I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. If you please let me be a missionary, just let me be a missionary. And uh, I got me a good job at Tennessee Temple and got a job and worked my way through school and finished in four years and didn't know a penny because I just got my salary and gave it to the school. <laughs> and uh, I thought my life was getting away from me. I got to get there in a hurry. And lo and behold, the mission accepted me. I thought they'll never accept me, and they did. And I, I got to the field, and I was so excited. When you apply to a mission, you are an appoint, you're a candidate. What's when you get accepted? You're an appointee. And then when you get on the airplane, you're a missionary. <laughs> I know that doesn't make a missionary, but that's the way they categorize it. And I wanted on that airplane. I had never been on an airplane before in my life. I wanted on that airplane, but I'm going to be a missionary. I'm going to be a missionary. I go to that airplane. Oh, I'm a missionary. I'm a missionary. You know, I said, goodbye, everybody. I'm out of here. I'm gone. Yeah. And I was so excited. I was just so excited. And uh, I got to the field, and they put me in a, a you know what a King Strand house is? It's a, it's a metal building. And you want to do that in the tropics, just get in your oven, turn it up to about 120 degrees, and you'll know what that felt like. Well, nobody, of course, no missionaries were, had been living in that house for years because they discovered you can't do it. But they uh, cut all the grass off around it and, and put me in it. Yeah. And uh, it had uh, used to be screens over there, but the screens were all torn out, and these big jungle rats had taken over. Now, when I was at Temple, I'd hear these missionaries coming there talking about rats and snakes and all these sort of things. Now, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do every bit of it. I'm going to do it. And I got these big old rats in that place. And I thought, oh, boy, look, I wrote back home, and I said, I've got rats as big as elephants over here. You will believe these rats. I was so excited. Yeah. <laughs> I got this big rat trap, and I caught seven in one night. Didn't even scratch the surface. And uh, I, I was just so excited. Now, I'd been there just a couple of days. The biggest spider I'd ever seen was over there on the wall. 
And I thought, wow, look at that spider, man. And I thought I should swat it. But when I started to swat it, it jumped right at me. Well, I reacted the way most of you ladies here would, and some of the men. <laughs> but I got so excited, I said, now, you, I, not only do I have spiders, I have attack spiders. <laughs> you don't get much more missionary than that. That's right. <laughs> and food, I just you bring it, I'll eat it. Whatever you eat, you just bring it, I'm going to eat it. And, uh, but when I, before I went to the field, people would say, what are you going to do? That irritated me. Yeah. I know they meant, are you going to be a nurse or a bookkeeper or a secretary or what? And I'm going to be a missionary. Yeah. A missionary goes and tells people about Jesus, right? Yeah. But that's what I wanted to do. I'm going to be a missionary. And of course, I want to tell people about Jesus, but I couldn't tell them anything because I couldn't speak the language. Not only that, I was sure they were making fun of me. And after I learned the language, I really found out they really had been making fun of me. <laughs> but uh, I, I was just so excited, and I wanted to learn the language, and I wanted to tell them about Jesus. And so I yeah. studied the Indonesian language, and then moved down to the south coast of this place, in the jungle, right in the middle of the jungle, no roads. The only way to get in was a small one-engine airplane, or I could land the little airplane, the float plane, could get in, a float plane landed on the river. But when you got there, you, you go nowhere. And there's just these little, little rivers just curling around there in the middle of the jungle, little villages just dotted along those rivers. And uh, I got there, of course. I want to tell them about Jesus, but yet I can't talk to them. Now, they were speaking the Chitak language, which was an unwritten language, and so I began to work really hard on analyzing the language, reduce it to writing, and you know, make the alphabet and work out the grammar. And, uh, began translating a few little things, a little Bible study courses, a little Bible stories, yeah. songs. And of course the goal was for, for Bible translation. But you know, I got there and I wanted to tell these people about Jesus. I just fell in love with those folks. Yeah. Just as soon as I got there, I fell in love with those people and I wanted to tell them so bad. And so I studied really hard and, and made an idiot out of myself a few times. And I'd say, okay, we're gonna have a ladies class. Everybody would show up, everybody. And uh, now remember, children are undisciplined and children don't wear diapers. <coughs> so you can picture it yourself. <laughs> and I learned right at the very beginning, don't call anybody down if a kid over here misbehaves. And I call that kid down, everybody yells at that mother. So I created more destruction or more problems by calling somebody down. So I just hope that some, after a while, they're gonna get them under control. But I, I thought they don't understand a word I said. So I would say, okay, we're gonna have another latest class. <coughs> They'd all show up. <coughs> and I would struggle and struggle. I thought, they had no idea what I said. <laughs> Finally, I thought, now they understand. For three years, after I was sure they were understanding me, I told them the same thing. I told them the same thing. You know, Jesus died and he rose again. And, yeah. But you know, you can't start with Jesus. You start to start with creation. Yeah. And so I would, uh, but I'd tell the same thing. And one day, my good friend Pam Otter, she says, no, do you tell us that all the time? And I thought, do something about it then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, you have to, we start with God. You know, there's somebody up there in the sky that created all of us. He created those fish in the rivers where you get your food. Yeah. And he created the sun, moon, and stars. And he created you and he created us. And we'd say, he sent us here to tell you that he loves you. And we tell them that God up there has this really nice village. Yeah. They don't get sick because, see, they didn't have medicine until we got there. And they don't kill each other. Right. They don't cry. Nobody dies. And I would ask them, how many of you ever done anything wrong? Oh, we've all done something wrong. But I said, but that creator up there, he said the tiniest little bad stuff, he's not going to let come. Because if he does, then it's not going to be a good village. So he can't let any bad stuff in. So I've just told everyone, you can't go because you all admitted you've done bad stuff. But then I'd tell him, but that creator up there, he opened a path for you. He had a son, and his name was Jesus. And he came here and he became human. He never did anything wrong. And they would say, he did nothing wrong? And I'd say, no. He made no mistakes at all? No. And they still killed him? Yes. And they said, no, that's not good. They love the stories of Jesus. They'd say he walked right on top of the water. Yes, he walked right on top that's of the right. water. Amen. And they'd say the, the 
you know, he, he, this stuff here, this stuff rose from the dead. Yeah, this stuff rose from the dead. The, the, the blind man, he was blind like this, and then he could see like this, yes. And they really loved the stories of Jesus. But you got to the substitutionary death of Christ, lost them. Wow. It was just like we had a physical barrier right here. They just look at me like, you know, you're not making any sense. And they would ask me, did you ever know Jesus? No, he lived a long, long time ago before I was born. Did he speak your language? No, he didn't speak my language. Was he from your tribe? No, he wasn't from my tribe. And they'd look at me like, you are not making any sense. For three years, we taught and we taught and we taught. You know, you, you get your, you know, sometimes you learn something that you already knew. Yeah. <laughs> and we thought, I love these people. I learned their language. Now, and they're all resp they're responsive. They're ready. Just teach us. We're ready to hear. But nothing was happening. And we began writing letters and, and uh, letters home and say, please pray. We can't, we can't open their hearts. I can't make them understand right. something as foolish as the gospel. And it doesn't make sense if you try to put yourself in their place. And so we began to write letters home. And we began praying, just praying really hard, you know, that the Lord would open their hearts because I can't do that. That's right. And I wish, I, could, I wish you could have seen what happened. It was just like that. Overnight, overnight, just yeah. overnight. Everybody. They started coming to my house, half a dozen. While I'm praying with them, there'll be another about there. Across over here is a different language. And they began coming. And they were just, just coming by the, yeah. you know, six, eight, ten. And I had some of the men that had been working with me on language. And we'd been, they'd been doing the preaching. And I called them in and let me show you how to, what to do, how to lead somebody to the Lord. And they came in, and I trained them, and, okay, you take that, you take those, and you take those, and then I'll take these. And we just uh, began, just, it was just amazing, it began to spread out into the outlying villages. And this was such an exciting time for us. And, uh, you know, when you see that, can anybody take credit for it? I had tried. <laughs> I learned their language, and I taught them over and over again. Yeah. But then to see the, the conviction. Yeah. Where one morning, one day we were sitting in church and Ogden was preaching. And uh, I was sitting beside Petey. Petey's fidgeted and fidgeted and I thought, she must be sick. She feels bad. She fidgeted and fidgeted the whole service. And uh, when Ogden started, he just started to give an invitation and she just did like that. So uh, I was going to pray with her and she thought she had to confess every sin. Yeah. She started out. Their favorite sin is to steal somebody's fish. If they set their fish line and then they leave it and a you know, fish gets on it, somebody else comes along and takes the fish off of it. And so she began confessing her sin. She said, that's when I stole so-and-so's catfish. And that's when, I, uh, that's when I beat my kids. And that's when I did this. And this is when I stole somebody else's fish. And then she said this one. Then she started naming her fingers. She got all 10 fingers. She stuck her foot up. She started doing her toes. Then she stuck the other one up, and I thought, she's running out of anything to count. <laughs> she got through her, all her toes. Then she sat there for a few seconds, and she says, God, there's lots more in there. Yeah. And she asked God to forgive her, asked him to save her. Yeah. Yeah, she got through praying, and she says, now I can go to heaven, can I? Yeah. Uh, yes, now you can oh. go to heaven. And, and what a thrill it was. Yeah. To see this conviction of sin and realizing that I, I'm wrong and I, I need, some, need a savior. And what a joy, what a thrill it was. And then uh, we, the next thing is we got to teach them about baptism. So uh, we uh, got some of the men, the men who were, were saved and were working with me. And I uh, said, so you're the ones going to examine the candidates because they know them better than I do. Well, my good friend, Pam Motter. Now, if Pam Motter, somebody came to my house and says, your friend is sick, I knew they were talking about Pam Motter because we were very close friends. And my friend, Pam Motter, she went through that baptismal class three times before they would accept her for baptism. The reason was her mouth was too big. Well, I'm sure glad I didn't have to go through that. I'd never get baptized. <laughs> but she, they finally approved her for baptism. And again, it was just like this, you know, it, and it's very hot, it's very humid, you've got 100 degrees, 110 degrees, 90% humidity, you don't want to stand on that riverbank all day long. 
So sometimes we would baptize two at a time. Sometimes they'd baptize three at a time. One time I saw them baptize four at a time. You got four men in the, in the, in the water, baptize them at a, at a time. Out the outlying villages, we'd go out to the outlying villages. And, and what an exciting, what an exciting thing it was to see. And then to see the people begin to grow. Then we said, well, the next thing is communion. By this time, we didn't have scripture. I was still working and hadn't got any scripture translated yet, so I was just teaching them. I thought I had taught them very well. It came time we were going to have a, a communion. You know, a missionary without a camera is not a missionary. You can't be a missionary without a camera. We all got our cameras. And we went to the, down to the church we had built right in the middle of the village, and we went down to the church. Nobody was there. Nobody was in the village. Everybody was gone. The preacher was gone. I guess we're not having communion today. In fact, we're not having anything because they've all disappeared. Found out that they'd gotten hold of that part about eating or drinking unworthily. Yeah. And they thought that if they partook of communion, they were all going to die. So the preacher let them all, <laughs> let them all out into the jungle to hide. <laughs> well... They came back and we said, well, I guess we need to do some more teaching. We haven't teach, taught them well enough. So we uh, taught some more. And then uh, we went back and tried it again, and we had communion. Now, you men are going to like this part. You women probably not going to. But Obden, Obden, I called him Peter because he was always so, you know, he always had something to say about everything. And, I, and he came to me and he says, uh, we're going to have a, our first Christian wedding. Oh, you are? Okay. So uh, you need some help with it? Nope. He said, I know what to do. I thought, oh, this is going to be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well, Ogden, he had a little bench up in front. Little, we had a little podium that we had built, and he put this bench. And uh, the men sit on one side and the women on the other side. So I had to go over here and get Tabita, who was over there facing that wall, and bring her up. And she sat down on the bench like this. And I went over there, and, and it got Torka. And I brought him over. He sat down on the other end of the bench like this. <laughs> Well, Ogden preached. I wish I'd had a recording of it. It was so classic. He said, God created man. He created man first. And then he created the woman. The man is the boss. <laughs> and his job is to tell the wife what to do. <laughs> he says, it's like this. There's God, there's man, and there's the woman. And I was thinking, cut that thumb off, Buster, and see how you like it. <laughs> but that was, a, that was his entire sermon. And then he had them stand up, and, and, and Tabita, she was very shy. She just, and he says, Tortica, you promised to boss Tabita? He said, yeah. <laughs> he says, Tabita, you promised to do what he says? He tells you to chop firewood, you're going to do it? He tells you, cook sago, you're going to do it. Whatever he tells you to do, you're going to do it. She said, <laughs> she was too shy. She didn't get a sound out. He said, I pronounce you man and wife. <laughs> I was over there about three years ago, and uh, they have a house full of children and are still in the process of living happily ever after. So <laughs> however, however it worked, it worked for them. But it was just so exciting to see them grow and, and yeah. adding little things and adding more to it and uh, seeing the churches, and there are about 23 churches. There are three at Singo where I live. One is an Indonesian-speaking church for outsiders who've come in there, and one is for the language. There's a language just across the airstrip down here, Tamnim, and then there's Chitak language, so there were three churches. But then the outlying villages were about 20. So there are about 23 churches, and uh, they're still going, going well. And uh, this is something very unusual because... Uh, I don't preach. <laughs> so uh, we have never had, never have had a missionary who has ever preached in any of these churches. They've all, from the very beginning, but from the people. So when we left, all the missionaries have gone. When we left, they just carried on because they had been doing it from the very beginning. Now, I have to promise you, I heard heresy in those early years. And I was just, oh. <laughs> <laughs> because they'd get it mixed up. And you have to be careful because I would teach them something and, and if you don't teach them, if you, if you forget to put something in there, they'll make it up. Oh, yeah. And uh, 
when I first got there, they called me Nona, which just means miss. And every, the, but he'd get up to preach, and he'd say, the Nona said, the Nona said, now this is not going to work. <laughs> so I showed, him, I showed him my Bible, and I said, this is God's word. Yeah. Then I showed him the Indonesian Bible. This is it translated into Indonesian language, and we're going to translate it into your language. But what I'm teaching you is what I got out of this book. Yeah. So when you preach, don't say the Nona said, you say God said, That's because it came out of this book. So he gets up Sunday morning and he says, you think this stuff I've been teaching you is what the Nona said? No, she's got a book. And they're going to put it in my language. And it's, it's what God said. So what I'm teaching you is what God said. Amen. He said, God left that book in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. <laughs> oh, yes, I guess I forgot something. <laughs> but uh, what, what, what much fun it was to watch them grow. And then... Uh, I went to the field in 1964. I tell people the most rewarding thing I did was be able to translate the New Testament into both those languages, Chitak and Tamnim, and have a big dedication service. And what, just to give them God's word in their language, I just can't tell you what a joy, what a thrill. Amen. And I remember that we did the dedication in Tamnim, the old village chief, Wapet, he came up and they could pick up what color they wanted. We had blue and black and red. They could come up and pick up the color they wanted. And I've got a video that I love. He was hugging his New Testament. Yeah. He, he couldn't read a word. <laughs> but he was so proud to have it, although he couldn't even read it. And what a joy it was. To, that was my most rewarding thing to do is to, to do that. And I'm going to share just a little bit. And I have to be careful because when I start this part, you may be here till 3 o'clock this afternoon. But uh, now the most exciting thing I ever did. Uh, I went to the field in 1964. Some people think that I, I got off the airplane and went right straight to headhunters. No, I didn't. The people I was working with here, they had been headhunters, but they had quit before I got there. So they were not practicing headhunting when I got there. But in, in the September of 1980, I came back from furlough. And the pilot, he makes the same trip. He's up here in the mountains, he crosses the mountain ranges, then just comes down and it's just flat all the way down to where we live. He makes that same route every three to six weeks, bringing mail and uh, brings us some vegetables from the mountains and uh, supplies that we've ordered. And so he makes that same trip. Now he doesn't fly very high because there are no mountains. So if there's anything down there, it's got to be right under him because if it's an awful little piece, the jungle just covers it up. Well, he, uh, he uh, told me that he was seeing some villages. He said, there may be three. He wasn't sure. But he said, they're still living up in the trees, in the tree, you know, where they build their houses up in the treetops. And uh, we said, we didn't know anybody was up there. You know, it just so happened. Yeah. See, they were still practicing cannibalism, so they move a lot to, <clears throat> to hide from their enemies. So they had uh, moved right into the path of the airplane. And he told us about it. Well, we were curious about who these people were. <clears throat> were they, I'm going to have to have a drink of this water, thank you. <laughs> but they were, <clears throat> they were right up close to, not too far, about halfway between us and the mountain. So we were curious, as they, were they more related, <clears throat> more related to us or they're more related to the tribes up next to the mountains? Being the linguist, I got to go in on the first trip. Now, they didn't know what was going to happen. They might not have let me go. But after that first trip, they couldn't have kept me out of there. Yeah. And uh, three of us were going to go in. We knew that we couldn't land because they cut the trees down and just leave them where they cut them. So, you know, they laid on top of each other. So one log made this out of the ground, the other side on the ground. They're all different heights. And so the deal was the pilot was going to hover over these logs, and we're going to swing out of that helicopter. Onto these logs. That's when I was young enough to swing out of a helicopter. <laughs> I'm afraid I'd plop out now. But anyway, he was going to hover over these logs, and he's going to go over and and uh, and land over there where on another river where he could land, and then he's going to wait a couple hours, and he's going to come back and get us. And you know, I don't ever think or remember how am I going to get back up in that helicopter. I was too concerned about how I was going to get out of it. Yeah. I was I wasn't thinking about how I'm going to get back up in it. But anyway. He comes in, there was a, see, he was, a, he was a new pilot. He had been a rescue pilot in Vietnam, so he was one to do it, but he wasn't familiar with the custom, customs of the people. 
So he was going to hover over these logs, and we looked down, and there were three of us. One was Domingos Mayora, who did not speak the Chitek language. He was from our Bible school, spoke Indonesian. And then Noak, Noak was a Chitekker, <clears throat> and me, just the three of us. So uh, there was this long building there. Now, these were all just native huts, you know, with thatch roof from, and, and just poles and things. That long building. We knew that was their ceremonial house. That's where they eat people. The pilot thought, that'd be a lovely place to drop us off. <laughs> so he comes down. We didn't see anybody at all at first. <clears throat> then he came in to hover over these logs, and we swung out of that helicopter. And I swung out of the helicopter right into the arms of stark, naked, birthday suit, naked men who were jumping up and down, shouting and chanting, and just, uh, just I mean, it was, it, was, it was bedlam. It was absolute total bedlam. And the pilot says, I'll hover overhead a while to be sure you're all right. Well, they were holding us. There's no way. And they're taking us into that long house where we didn't want to go. <laughs> and Noah, uh, Domingos was in front, and he kept saying, we'll just talk out here. But he's talking Indonesian. And I thought, they don't understand that. I got a glance at Noah behind me, and his eyes were really good. And he kept saying, we came to tell you about God. And I thought, we don't even know if they understand Chitak. Besides, if they did, they know who God is. I was too scared to say anything which is really scary. <clears throat> and they were pulling us into that long house. I could hear the pilot overhead. I couldn't even say, you know, come back and get us. I couldn't do anything. I had a bag over my shoulder and I'm white, and so I was getting all the attention. And I couldn't fall off the log. They were jumping up and down, jumping up and down, and the log is bouncing up and down. I couldn't go anywhere because they were, and they were taking us in there. And uh, I heard that pilot fly away. And I can't explain the feeling that came across me when he flew away. We found out later he announced to the whole island, they're getting a good reception, they're being hugged. <laughs> there was a difference in being hugged and being held. <laughs> and, uh, but when I, heard that, when I heard that helicopter fly away, I said, okay, Lord, you're all we've got. And I can't explain the peace. It was just like a peace just came across me. At the same time, I saw Domingo visibly relax. Okay. And they took us on into that house, put us down on the floor, and uh, they were still shouting around and jumping up and down and carrying on. And, and some of them were standing there, the, the rafters are only about this high, just poles and their bows and arrows and spears were there. And some of them were standing like that. And <laughs> just turn those things loose. Don't, just get away from those weapons. <laughs> they never took any weapons down, but they were very, they were very handy. And they were still shouting and chanting, and uh, we discovered they were speaking our language. We'd already told not to, uh, Coach Nowak as to what to do, and uh, he uh, went through what I just told you about the Creator, and uh, it, it was just, it was, it was bedlam. Every time he'd say something, they would all repeat it back and forth and back and forth, and I'm surprised I could hardly hear anything that he said. But uh, when he says that he's the one that sent us here to tell you that he loves you, and I got goose chills so big, I got so goose chills, and that I get to be here the first time I've ever heard the name of God, and this is so exciting, and to tell them about God for the first time. Yeah. And uh, uh, I, just so many things. I'd, I'd get back to sing going out there, you better, all the missionaries, you better get together because I am exploding yeah. <laughs> to tell them what happened on that trip. And then we began making periodic trips. The helicopter was very expensive. So we were trying to get them to make peace with their enemies and move down to a river so we could get in by, by outboard motor. And eventually they did move down there, and we kept going in and teaching them, and then we says it's time for us to go and stay with them. Mm -hmm. And so we, we stayed a couple of weeks on that first trip, and we just had a good time just sitting around with them, getting to know them, winning their trust, laughing. They, you'd never believe they were headhunters and cannibals because they had a beautiful sense of humor. They got off the middle of the snake one day. They had a good time chasing me with a snake. Yeah. But uh, it was dead. <laughs> but anyway, it was a snake. <laughs> But we had just, they just laughed and had a good time just laughing and talking and enjoying each other, winning their confidence, building on it. Every time we'd go, we'd build on it. Yeah. And I remember an old man, he came over to me and he said, what was that man's name that got killed? And I said, his name was Jesus. He said, I'm going to put it right here and I'm not going to forget it again. And uh, this was, see, at Singo where I lived, that, that first converse was three years after I was learning, fellow speaking the language. This one we kept going, kept going. This is about the 
five years from that first contact, I thought, okay, on this one we're going to have our first converts. I really believe we're going to, and I thought it would be be dope. The chief, the one who's killed the most people is automatically the chief. The chief was Powell. He was not interested in the gospel. He called me a liar a few times, <laughs> but he was not interested. Now he listened. He listened to everything we said, but not interested. Bedo, the assistant chief, he became assistant chief because somebody shot Powell right along here, and Bedo killed the man that shot Powell. So he became the assistant chief. Bedo was very interested from the very beginning. He just listened and just soaked it all up from the very beginning, and I thought, he'll be our first convert. We were on this one trip, and I thought, we were there for, I think, about a week, and I thought, we're going to have our first converts. This is going to be our first converts. And uh, Jacob preached on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And then he asked, is anybody if you'd like to confess your sins to God and ask him to forgive you? And uh, one man says, I do. Another man says, I do. Yeah. And uh, so we took him, and, but Bedo, he didn't make a move. He, he looked very, very interested all through the message. He didn't make a move. I was disappointed. I thought Bedo's going to be the first convert. But these other two men, we took them into the little hut where we were staying and talked with them. And they prayed and asked God to forgive them. And I, oh, our first converts, our first converts, two men. And Bedo, I said, where's Bedo? They said, he's gone off into the jungle and he won't be, you know, we were in the middle of the jungle, but he's going off to fish and hunt and says he won't be back <clears throat> for several days. Well, we were leaving the next day. <clears throat> So I thought, well, Beto won't get saved on this trip. It'll be the next one, I believe. Yeah. Well, Beto got there in the jungle, and, and the Lord was dealing with him. Yeah. And uh, he came late that evening, and he came in, and he had to be a big fish he had just caught. And, hey, thank you. We were standing out in front of the little hut, and he says, uh, when I killed those people, God saw me, didn't he? And I said, yes, he did. He said, when I stole those women, God saw me do that, yes. He said, I chopped an osarep man's chest open with an ax. <laughs> he said, God saw that. I said, yes. I said, Beto, that's what we came here for. He said, tell you that God will forgive you. Yeah. And so we took brought him in the house, yeah. and we talked with him. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget the prayer that Beto prayed. He said, God, I've killed and eaten people. I've stolen women. I chopped that man's chest open with an ax. And he said, I just don't want you to think about that anymore. That's their way of asking for forgiveness. And I'm sitting there with goose chills, now God's yeah. forgotten, and he'll never think about it anymore. It's gone. He'll never. And I think sometimes, you know, God's grace is so great. You know, these people are headhunters and kill people and eating people, and they would go, you know, kill the men and steal the women, and all this, and God's grace will convict yeah. them and save them. What a, what a thrill. Just a, <clears throat> there were three of these villages, Bacabus, Son, and, and <laughs> they changed the name of them. I have to remember what they were back then. But uh, <clears throat> the other village over here, if you look at the book over there, <clears throat> on the front of that would be Bowater. Bowater was the chief. I've forgotten, I think he killed about five people. And he was the chief over there, young, just a younger guy. And uh, <clears throat> over, over at Vakabus, Sido died. And, Bo, and Bowater over here said Sido had died. He said, he never asked God to save him, did he? I said, no, he didn't. And uh, so he says, then he went to hell, didn't he? I said, I'm afraid he did. Boy, I says, can I ask him, uh, can I confess my sins, ask him to save me? <laughs> you sure can. <laughs> so out in the, in the middle of the village, out in the yard, prayed with Bedo, with, with Bowater. And Bowater, after he prayed, I said, Bowater, I said, who's your father now? I remember we'd been teaching him for several years. Who's your father now? He said, God's my father. Yeah. I said, well, God's my father. So what does that make us? He smiled real big and he said, we're brothers and sisters. Hey. Yeah, we're brothers and sisters. And what a joy, what a joy. And then uh, fast forward to I'm coming home. I'd been there for over 40 years. And they would, you know, they build us these native churches and they, with six months they're on the ground. You know, they got to start over. So we said, we'll help you. <clears throat> And I told them, we're not going to build your church for you. We'll send our men up with a chainsaw. They'll cut your trees down. You're going to 
do the work, and I give you, I'll, I'll supply nails, and I'll supply uh, zinc for the roof. But you're going to do the work. It's got your church. You built your church. And uh, they, I said, they said, what are we going to name it? You name it. And I thought, I wish I'd named it because I could even pronounce the names they named them. <laughs> I don't know where they got them from. But so all three of those villages, we helped them build churches. Amen. And we went up to Bowater's village to dedicate a church. I was leaving in just about three days after that. And uh, so we went up and had the dedication of the church. And we were coming out. We were getting ready to get on the boat to go back to Singo, where I lived. And then a couple of days, I'd catch the airplane. I was coming home to retire. And Bowater came over to me. He says, Nona, thank you for coming. He says, you brought us out of the darkness into the light. Thank you for telling us how we could go to heaven. The whole 40 years. That was worth the whole 40 yeah. years. Amen. And folks, when I got on that airplane in 1964, as a 24-year-old lady who thought my life was already, I thought my life was, I, 20, I thought I was old at 24. <laughs> and uh, got on that airplane, I was so excited. I thought God would let me. He, I got there, and I'm a missionary. I am a missionary. Yeah. This country girl, this bit of country girl, as I'm, I, I tell him I was a redneck hillbilly turned into a jungle bunny. So I said, I, he let me, he let me be a missionary. And all those things I daydreamed about, he far surpassed those. I never daydreamed about headhunters. <laughs> that was not part of my daydream. Yeah. But I, I was so excited that God would let me, he would let me be a missionary. And you young people that are in here, you let me tell you, you know, if I could do it over again, I would do it in a minute. Amen. And serving God is the greatest, most wonderful thing. Yep. And you'll, never, you'll never have any other thing to do with your life than a serving God. And uh, I will tell you just a quick story. I was out, uh, the ambassador to Indonesia came to our island. Now there were, the only Americans there were missionaries. And I just happened to be out there because I was out, it was out in the capital. I just happened to be out there. I don't know, I was out doing shopping or whatever we needed to do when he came. And this is a big deal, you know, for, for these people. You know, all this security and stuff, he didn't need the security. They had no idea who he was. So, you know, he didn't need any security. But anyway, they had all that, you know, the military all surrounding the building. And uh, all the missionaries could come into the, this one mission office and meet him. So the whole place was full of people. And we had a little Indonesian lady that was going to serve cookies and drink. Well, there was a whole crowd of people. So I went back to help her. And she said, no, 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 you get out there, honor your ambassador. He's your ambassador. And I said, but let me help you. There's a lot of people out there. No, no, no. She kept shoving me away and shoving me away. And I said, wait a minute. I said, that guy out here? I said, he's an ambassador for the president of the United States of America. And I said, us? We're ambassadors for the King of Kings. I said, let's get this guy out of here. And <laughs> let's give him a cookie and get him out of here. Let's give him a cookie. And serving the King of Kings, what an honor. What an honor. I will never, I will never be able to thank him enough for the privilege of serving him. So I was excited when I got on that airplane. And folks, I'm still excited. Hey. I'm just excited about who he is. I'm sharing this with you. And and I hope that, is, that what I've shared with you, that you will say that we have a great God. Yes. We serve a great God. And a, no greater joy than serving the Lord.